All right, we are back with the Lineup Podcast. I'm Dave Prodan. I'm here with my part-time co-host for the season, Mitchell Salazar. Mitch, it has been a minute since we last podcasted due to the Olympic gap in the CT season this year, but we are back. The final regular season event of the 2024 WSL Championship Tour, the Corona Fiji Pro presented by Bonsoy, has come to a close. We now have the WSL Final Five men's and women's surfers who will be competing for the world title in a couple of weeks at the Lexus WSL Finals at Lower Trestles. We've completed the 2024 Visla CT Shaper Rankings Battle and determined this year's Shaping World Champion. In short, you and I have a ton to talk about, but first, how are you doing today, man? Where are you? What have you been getting up to? Uh, first of all, Dave, appreciate you having me back. It's been a couple of months since we've spoken, but uh, yeah, just at home in Costa Mesa right now. Uh, waves have been really fun lately in Southern California, as you know. I think we've all gotten a lot of water time, and especially with the water and the weather being so nice lately, it's been truly awesome to be here in Southern California, but we got a flat spell coming right before the final, so hopefully we're able to get some more surfs in, but um, yeah, just overall, what an amazing event, you know, I feel, I feel like even though we didn't see perfect Fiji, it was still really fun. It's a real good development to what we should be seeing next year at the finals there. And um, overall, I think the wild card stood out. Um, you know, even though Sierra wasn't able to get a, a win in her first CT event, I still think she got a lot of experience sharing that moment with her father. Josh was a big thing. Aaron Brooks, obviously a huge story. But, um, you know, I was really, really interested to see the development of the Final Five race on both the men's and women's side. It turned out, you know, a bit surprising to me, especially on the women's end. But, um, mm. you know, on the men's side, it was really competitive. Uh, really amazed to see some amazing heats over there. For sure. I think Fiji, to me, was like a good exercise in expectation management. Of course, we all want to see like huge, massive first ledge, clean condition, long period swell. And I think the forecast that we got from Surfline leading up to it, we're like, oh, I don't know. This doesn't look great. It's been a bit of a weird summer. And even Jonathan Warren, he was saying, man, he goes, it, there's been great days here and there, but it's been really like feast or famine. You get a really good day coming out of the South Pacific and then just a bunch of weird days or non-swell days. So I think in the end, we were all kind of surprised at both the size and quality of those three days. Obviously, we had overhead surf the first couple of days. Um, it, that that kind of short period, and I think Kelly commented on it. You and I were talking about during that Ryan Callanan heat of it was pushing so fast up the reef. And even for the world's best surfers, like I think during that Ryan Callanan heat, we're like, man, he can't even get a turn off because <laughs> his board's just going so fast. And then the second day, I think we were all expecting it to drop, but it, it, it maintained, it was cleaner. That was really exciting. And even the third day, even though the swell dropped, it's still better than you know most places on the planet. And we yeah. saw some like really high performance ripping, but you know, let's get into it. What are your first losers coming out of the Corona Fiji purpose by Bonsoy? Well, especially with the waves that we had on offer and, and how good she's been and how consistent she's been all year, it has to be Gabby Bryan. Um, unfortunately, she bows out of the top five race, loses to eventual champion Aaron Brooks, but it was a deciding moment in both her career and within the heat right there, under 90 seconds to go. Mm -hmm. She had a priority. It was an overlapping heat format, so I give her that, but um, in the end, you need to be a lot more competitive. You need to be way smarter in those moments in the heat, especially when your career is on the line like that. And not to say that she's not going to have future opportunities, but this was a golden one, especially right here when you're doing it with this kind of generation that we have on our hands. You want to make top five right now. She ends up losing to Aaron, ends up losing out of the top five. And unfortunately for her, her season's done. Um, still a fantastic year, though. Her first win, two finals, especially you know how she was able to beat Caitlin Simmers in the semis mm -hmm. over there at Punta Roca. Still an outstanding year for Gabby and her career best result, Dave. So a lot of positives to take from this, but definitely a missed opportunity right there in Fiji. Yep, that, that's my first loser too. The lineup's very own Gabby Bryan. You know, we love her surfing. We, we call her an unofficial lineup team rider. And I agree, she's had an awesome year. I was really looking forward to her potentially playing a dark horse spoiler in the upcoming Lexus WSL finals at Lower Trestles. But yeah, as you pointed out, you know, she lets Aaron Brooks go under her priority with, with 90 seconds left remaining. And, and to be honest, up until that point through the opening round, the elimination round, and, you know, I watched those heats pretty closely. Aaron hadn't looked that good to me up until that point. You know, kind of flicky, like didn't really look like she was like leaning into her turns. Of course, the forecast and the, the swell direction had something to do with it. And then she gets that 6.83 on that final wave. Gabriella goes down. Joanne DeFay, who had won the heat previous, hops over Gabriella to get into the top five. And, and that's kind of all she wrote, um, which is a real bummer for Gabby. But... 
I do want to maintain, I think the past two years of her surfing have really impressed me. You know, her surfing in all conditions seems to be on point and getting better. And in addition to her surfing in the water, I think she's got a pretty strong mental game, you know, last heat notwithstanding. So I do think she will take that loss into the off season and come back in 25 with the potential to really continue to improve. But uh, yeah, it's a bummer to watch for me. Definitely was. And, you know, for somebody that relies so much on strategy and being so effective at that, um, it was really the only one time the entire season that we saw her not kind of push that envelope right there and it cost her in the end. But um, no, I agree with you. I think she's had a great attitude all season. Um, I think she's going to continue to add on to that in 2025. And especially with Richard Doc March in her corner too, mm. I feel like she's going to have a real good upcoming season. But um, you know, my second loser is actually something very similar to that. It's everybody kind of overthinking and oh, saying that the Olympics kind of ruined everything. I think post-Olympic fatigue wasn't really a thing. I thought we had a great event over there in Tahiti. It was kind of a nice gap, but seeing everybody really be able to shine and compete in a different way brought out the best of them into this event right here, especially those people that maybe struggled during the Olympics. Mm. They looked way better right now. Griffin Colapinto mm. lost out to eventual gold medalist Kali Voss. He won the event, Dave. Molly Picklem, career best result right here in Fiji, first time competing, but still she hadn't broken through the quarters up until this point, makes the semifinals right now. Big result for her. Joanne DeFay was the bronze medalist. She did very well, even though she missed out of the top five. But I just feel like there was so much discussion about everybody just being ready to kind of let the year go over. Mm. Not the case. I felt like everybody competed way better. Ethan Ewing made the semis. Real Wida made his first final. I thought everybody really used that kind of momentum and especially the competitive shift from that environment into the CT environment, once again, they looked way better. So post on fatigue wasn't really a thing to me, Dave. That's a great one. I didn't think of that, but that's a, a good trend that you recognized. Second loser from Fiji to, for me, uh, unfortunately, is the GOAT. 11-time world champion Kelly Slater. He was awarded a wildcard spot in Fiji. We talked about the forecast. As we know, it wasn't stellar relative to what the place can deliver. But as we said, I think it actually over-delivered on the pre-event expectations. Opening round, Kelly gets dusted by Baron Mamiya and eventual event winner Griffin Colapinto. And then in the elimination round, Yagodora puts up 16.83 to Kelly's 10.93, and it never looked close. And that was it. And I think if you look over the last five years, right, you got 2019, Kelly finishes the year in eighth, which is his last season in the top 10. Uh, we didn't have a season in 2020. 2021, he finishes 18th. 2022, he wins pipe, but he finishes the season 15th. 2023, he finishes 23rd, and he needs the WSL wildcard to return in 2024. This season, 17th at pipe, 17th at Sunset Beach. He doesn't go to Portugal. 17th at Bells Beach, 17th at Margaret's, and he doesn't make the cut. He did receive a wildcard in Tahiti. We had pumping swell for that event, and he looked great. Um, but he did go down to Ramsey Bukayam in the quarterfinals, and you know, he is someone who has made an unprecedented impact on the sport. And you could argue on, on people's lives. And I think you see that in the surfing world wanting to celebrate him and what he's achieved at the end of his career. You saw it when he won pipe in 2022. You saw it in Margaret River this season. You saw it in Tahiti this season. You saw it in Fiji last week. And yet he hasn't committed to retiring. He actually seems kind of allergic to the word. <laughs> so everyone is in this odd place with it, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, were he to be offered wild cards in the future, he would accept them. But I think the surfing world is starting to ask why. Um, so, yeah, it, it felt just kind of weird to me in Fiji. And there's that beautiful tribute, you know, I love watching him surf, always will, but it's a little bit like amorphous around this sort of bookend to his competitive career. And uh, yeah, he's my second loser coming out of Fiji. Uh, it's funny that you bring up the retirement word because uh, <laughs> I, I almost do think that he actually is allergic to it or just like non-existent to him in his own mind. But, um, you know, I feel like, as you said, if you offer him another wild card, he's going to take it. And um, if it continues to be a trend, he'll continue to be able to surf in these events. And, you know, he's he's still very competitive. I can tell you that he was really pissed when he lost to Ramsey mm. in Tahiti. He was extremely pissed when he lost to Iago right here in Fiji. Like the way he slapped the water to me just really shows that he's still a competitor. I just don't think that there's a mindset of his to be able to pull that off 
within mm. a calendar year, though. And um, well, if you let- want to be able to do that, like in a 12 month period, you really got to dedicate. He hasn't surfed lately, and that's right. the thing. It's like, okay, you're competitive still, but like, put your time into it. Like everybody else is mm. doing it, you know, Dave. Well, let me ask you this, Mitch, because you you surf at such a higher level than me. But that water slap in Fiji, do you think it had more to do with him getting bounded out in the elimination round or more to do with he didn't feel like he could put on a show? Because there's a version of events where he doesn't really care what his result is as much as he wants to prove that he's still an elite level surfer, probably mostly to himself. And I just feel like he hasn't felt like he's gotten the opportunity to do that or he just hasn't done it with the opportunities Mm -hmm. he's had. Well, I think when I realized that he still had it in pumping and perfect surf, Mm. when he beat Ethan over there in Tahiti, I was like, okay, like if the waves are a certain way, there's no doubt that he's still very capable of winning the entire event, Um, especially with strategy. Mm. You know, you don't necessarily have to be catching 10, 12 waves in a heat. You can catch three, four, especially when it just comes down to it being two. Like he knows how to do that. But um, to me, it's a combination of both things. I feel like he wanted to perform way better for himself, as he said. It's it's more of an inside thing for him. Mm-hmm. But it's also like due to the lack of perfect waves that he probably was expecting. And I think that's why competition on the CT is so much more different. Like we have days to wait, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we're always going to have perfect waves the entire time. So like there are situations where you do have to recur back to QS surfing, Challenger Series surfing, where it's like, Hey, if I have to grind out a couple of sixes, I got to be able to do that. And Yaga was able to adapt Mm -hmm. in that heat that he had. And especially with the overlapping format that is usually so beneficial to Kelly, it wasn't the case in this one. Um, I still think we're going to see him a few times next year, though. (laughs) I'd I'd be extremely surprised if he doesn't at at least get one wild card. But um, overall, you know, I thought the the package that Outer Gnome put out was really, really awesome. to me, I think he's still capable of winning in perfect waves, as I said before. If you give him an opportunity to compete as a wild card, though, in poor waves, will he excel the same way? No, definitely not, especially against the youngster. So there needs to be a time where he's going to be reasonable and think to himself, I saw the forecast. I'm going to deny it ahead of time so that way they can replace me with mm-hmm. somebody else that actually wants this opportunity to compete in poor waves. I think that should be the call for him. That's a good point. Well, last thing I'll say on that, too, I, I would argue... And he's been through some amazing generations of talent on tour. Mm -hmm. I I think in 2024 and beyond, like the level collectively amongst the CT has never been higher. You know, Mm -hmm. so it's not just, oh, if the waves are pumping like in Tahiti, he's a walk up start to win the event. It's like, no way, man. Like it's everyone can do everything at this level now and he's he's going to have to fight for it. But uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, Who's your third loser coming out of Fiji? Yeah, it's actually a pretty surprising one, but uh, it's lower trestles. And I know we still got the Lexus WSL finals coming up in about two weeks. I just feel like Fiji, that was a four, maybe five out of ten right there. And the right. waves are really fun, especially both of us being goofy footers, Dave. Like, <laughs> that's kind of our paradise right there, you know. And it goes to show you that, like, there's so much around this that's put into it for the development of surfing and how much progress we want to see. Fiji's a perfect location just to have the 10 surfers right there ready to compete during a single day within a good waiting period, especially for perfect waves. They've earned it, and I, th- I feel like this event was kind of a, a preparation to that point right there. And um, overall, I know Lowers is a perfect wave. It's amazing. But Fiji really deserves to be a star next year during the finals, and I'm really excited to see it. I think a, a change of venue is also really good for everybody, and it kind of pushes the envelope for everybody else to want to get a better seed heading into next year, too. Imagine if Gabe's number one seed right there heading into 2025. It'd be really difficult to beat him, but then you also have the wild cards and the people that are really difficult to beat in those types of waves. Seth Moniz had an awesome performance. He beat Cole Hausman mm-hmm. in literally two minutes in the elimination round. I feel like there's always those people that can maybe change things a little bit more. Um, but overall, lower trestles, see ya whenever it is. Uh, hopefully you return as a regular CT event, but Fiji's going to shine come 25 for the finals. I like it. I like it. Uh, last loser I had out of Fiji is uh, the Brazilian Storm en masse. Uh, that's my third loser. And, you know, this is the first finals since it began that only one Brazilian male is in the top five. And that's Italo Ferreira, who held on to his finals position in that fifth fifth spot. You know, both Gabriel Medina and Iago Dora had a chance, and both of them looked awesome, uh, but couldn't get there in the end. So 
that's that. I, I do want to call out on the women's side, Brazilian Tatiana Weston Webb had a great event. She made the final and she earned her spot in the Lexus WSL finals. So I'm certainly looking forward to seeing if she can play spoiler there. But given what we looked at as far as the top five makeup, potentially heading into Fiji and, you know, hitters like Gabriel and Iago, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the Brazilian storm took a hit this year and, and we'll see if they come back uh, rejuvenated in 2025. That's a good call. I mean, despite Italo getting ninth, uh, I kind of felt like he was going to push things a little bit more. Mm. I'd be lying if I, you know, if I didn't say that I was a little hurt when Yago didn't make it right there. He was leading the heat the majority of it against Jack. And uh, unfortunately, Jack just had the best wave of the heat and knocked him out. And, you know, props to Jack, though. Like, he went out there with a committed mindset, knowing that he want to stay at number three in terms of the seeding. It was a big heat for him. And if he won the event, he probably could have overtaken um, Griffin Colopinto is the number two seed. Uh, I think that's a real good ideology to have, especially when you're going for your first world championship. Like, even though that's basically your brother right there, you still can't give an inch. And, um, you know, I thought Yago surfed his, his butt off. Uh, I thought Gabe had an amazing event up until that heat against Griffin. And, um, unfortunately for him, the waves got horrible during that heat right there. And, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of controversy in, in social media and whatnot, just knowing that, uh, we had to call the event off right after it. And I, I will say though, in our defense, we went on hold first thinking that the wind might back off a little bit and then we had to call it off for the rest of the day. But, um, you know, overall, I think Fiji's just such an amazing event and it led to so many great results, starting with my first winner, Griffin Colopinto. Like, mm. I thought he was so amazing all event long, so consistent. Um, his backhand has truly been perfected lately. Uh, great barrel riding. I thought his maneuver selection was excellent. But more than anything, it, it just seemed to me like he was confident. And uh, he's flowing with everything. He looks way better than he lived last year heading into the finals. And I think people got got to watch out with him because if we don't see Matthew McConaughey in the ba in the background, <laughs> if we don't see too many banners, I, I truly think he has a shot to become world champion at home. And he said it in interviews: "I might not have another chance like this once again in the future. I could be winning my first world championship at home at Lower Trestles, and it would be a huge opportunity for him. It kind of feels like uh, that might be happening in a few weeks, Dave." Great call out. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I think, you know, if you were in the John John Florence camp and I'd imagine that threat one is, you know, Gabriel Medina in Terminator mode just because of the pedigree <laughs> and the achievements. Threat two is probably just a focused and, and on point Griffin Colapinto. He's had that experience, right, um, with the, the hometown, you know, hype. Uh, at, at lowers for the finals uh, last year. So he has that under his belt. He can probably take, you know, the positives and negatives from that and channel it into this season. But it's going to be exciting at lowers in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, my first winner from Fiji is uh, Ethan Ewing, actually. You know, he's one of our favorite surfers. He's one of the touring surfers' favorite surfers. And we talked about it. He entered the final event of the regular season in fifth, and it was a, a vulnerable fifth at that. He was a couple thousand points back from fourth, and he had this murderer's row of surfers eyeing that spot. And, you know, he was one of the few surfers that opted to stay on the Motu with his coach, another North Stradbrook legend, B. Durbage. And he just looked nails from the jump. He was sharp, he was focused, and he not only survived the onslaught from those behind him on the rankings, he actually improved his position with a third in Fiji, moved up to fourth for the finals. You know, Ethan was there last year at Lower Trestles for the finals, and he was recovering from a broken back, and he still looked amazing. So, yeah, Ethan's definitely my first winner coming out of Fiji. And, you know, maybe I put, you know, Griffin is 1A and Ethan is uh, 1B on the threat list for John because Ethan out at Lower Trestles is incredible. Well, and I think this this class that qualified for the Lexus WSL finals is, is great, too. Mm. Not to say that the ones in, you know, the previous editions haven't been, but, like, just considering what we've been through this year, how consistent john been all year long. And, uh, you know, I think the only thing that Ethan's missing is a W in 2024 because out of the five people that qualified on the men's side, he's the only one that actually hasn't won an event. He's made a final might be the right time to do it right here at lowers and um especially as you said being runner up last year barely getting edged out against philippe in the first match of the grand finals i thought mm. it was an amazing display he was able to beat 
with a lot of ease. Griffin Colapinto, the hometown right. hero last year in 23. I think he's a real threat. Shout out to Italo, too. I know that he didn't have the best of events right here in Fiji. That guy can surf a lot of heats in a day, and he's definitely a big threat at number five in terms of the seeding, too. Um, my second winner has to be the runner-ups. Props to Tati, props to Rio, especially Tati. She had an outside shot of qualifying for the finals, but with the loss of Gironda Faye, she was able to make it into the final right there, get her spot, and ha had to settle for runner-up, which still isn't bad. She's also looking for her first W this year, Dave. But um, overall, got to give her a lot of props. She went through many things, silver medalist in the Olympics a few weeks before, too. So, like, pressure was on her the whole time. And for real, Wida, career best finish, second place in Fiji, first time coming back in seven years. He just surfed pumping a loose after going home for the first time in months, <laughs> after being on the road all year long. Kid's a, a, a workhorse, uh, really love him. And a historic day also for Indonesian surfing and Asian surfing overall. Top 10 finish this year in just his second year on the championship tour, Dave. Amazing stuff from Real Wida. Was able to be, defeat Ethan Ewing of the semis, too. I'm a huge fan of his, and especially with his character, I feel like he's going to be an addition to the top 10 for many years to come. I love that one. And Rio, he's like young, too, right? He's 24. So mm -hmm. I think he's someone who I was excited when he was blitzing the Challenger Series a couple of years ago. I was excited when he got on tour. He's so fast. I mean, you could make a case that he might just be the fastest surfer on tour. His backhand is incredible. And yep. I think he's only going to get better. You know, I think he has... He's a humble guy. He's a hard worker. As you pointed out, he stays away from home most of the year, just working on his craft. You see him put a little bit of muscle on in the coming years as he kind of matures physically, as well as continues to improve technically. Like he, he could just go from strength to strength. I was really excited to see him surf throughout this event, especially on the final day, even though the, the swell dropped a little bit. He just looks so fast and sparky. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's a great one. Um, my second winner coming out of Fiji is a little bit of a question mark, but it's, uh, you know, women's surfing, uh, in general. And I think it is a winner. We saw a 17 year old wild card surfing on, I think what Strider called a five foot three inch surfboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take out the world's best surfers <laughs> and the event. It was so impressive. You know, we talked about that sliding doors moment in that elimination round heat against Gabriella. And we talked about this too. I didn't think she looked that impressive in those first two rounds. And then after that wave and after getting through that heat, she just looked awesome. And yep. we had another celebrated youngster as a wild card in Fiji too. You talked about her, Sierra Kerr, you know, Josh Kerr's daughter. And we also have this amazing young crop of surfers already on the CT. We've got Katie and Molly and Betty Lou. And I think what you're seeing is is this talent kind of ascend collectively because of the platform, both the wave quality and the prize money that's been elevated over the last decade. And it is attracting and developing a ton of talent compared to previous generations. But I mean, all these other celebrated young women, you know, Katie, Molly, Betty Lou, Sierra Kerr, um, the list goes on, you know. The current generation on tour is probably a little bit terrified of what Aaron Brooks just did. And the future generation might be terrified as well. Um, I think as, as fans, we're going to benefit from seeing how this all plays out. But I mean, I, I was just so impressed with Aaron's development within the event, um, both in the water and, and sort of mentally. Yeah, I actually got um, a text from one of her coaches during the event. Uh, she actually sent me, he sent me a photo of Tati and her having you know, a, a couple of warm-up heats in Oceanside a few years ago. And um, I think the one thing that we're seeing out of Aaron Brooks, who, by the way, is my third winner, mm. she's opening up a lot of doors with her Canadian citizenship for homegrown talent over there, too, and finally getting much more exposure and eyes on that region because they've ha always had amazing surfers. As you know, Peter DeVries, he won a six-star QS back in 2009. Not something that easy to do. I know that he did it at home. Adapting to that water wasn't something that's difficult for him. That's still a major event when we were still doing the QS globally, and that mm -hmm. counted for qualification for the championship tour. Fast forward to just a few years later, Sanoa, Matea Dempleolin, the two sisters had a final over there in slow last year. First all-Canadian final on the QS. Matea was able to take it out. Sanoa Olin, silver medalist at the Pan Ams last year. She was an Olympian this year. Look at Wheeler Hasberg, Reed Platanius, WSL North America Junior Champion last year. Like, there's so much more talent coming out of that region. And with more eyes on Aaron, who's a representative of that beautiful country, there's going to be a lot of improvement. 
And we're talking about somebody who's 17 years of age, number four on the Challenger Series right now. She had back-to-back -back wins on the Challengers, by the way. Sakurema last year to finish out the year. She qualified for the Challengers automatically by finishing top 10. And then you fast forward to this year over at Snapper Rocks. She wins the event, also gets a perfect 10 with an that amazing was a crazy barrel. perfect 10. <laughs> Dude, makes the final right afterwards in Sydney, too. She's 17. She's been surfing for eight years. Radical stuff. I think this generation is probably the best I've ever seen out of women surfing. And I'm talking everybody 25 years or younger, too. You got to put Parisa Hennessy in there, Sakura, mm. obviously, you know, Katie, too, Caroline Marks. Like, the list can go on and on. I feel like we're in for a doozy when it comes to a lot of these young surfers qualifying for the CT in less than five years, I'd even say. It's a great point. Just a shout out to the Canadian surfing community for sure. Obviously, there's communities all over the country, Tofino being a major one. And, you know, Mitch, you're a baseball fan. And, you know, when I, I started out at the ASP 20 years ago and was traveling around, Peter DeVries was one of their sort of superstars that was coming down to North America, was doing a bunch of QS events. We did a bunch of events at Lowers. And, you know, I always kind of liken the talent coming out of, you know, the great white north and, and, and how cold it is and how much rubber you had to wear. It, a little bit like a, a baseball player, you know, swinging a bat and warm ups with a, a weighted donut on there. And, you know, when they would come down to lowers and even if it was like a cold spring or something for the QS event, they'd be in like short arm full suits. They'd been surfing <laughs> in six, five, four hooded booties at home. And they look so much faster, just like, you know, when the baseball player takes the donut off the bat and they're swinging yeah. that much faster. I, I, I always get excited seeing how much speed and power those surfers who come from colder climates bring with them w when they kind of come down south and, and travel around the world. So um, that's exciting. Uh, you know, my, my, my third and final winner from Fiji, um, we're going to continue with my time-honored tradition of, of jumping to the next section early, but it's Matt Biolis and Lost Surfboards. Um, back to back shaping world titles for Matt Biolis. Um, you know, they, they were shaping for Aaron Brooks. They absolutely dominated not only this season, but, but the Corona Fiji Pro presented by Bonsoy. They had Griffin Cola Pinto win the men's event. They had Aaron Brooks win the women's event. Crazy event for them. Amazing year. And, and, and for sure, we'll get into it in the upcoming segment. Yeah, pretty big call out right there. Not even close, really. Just under 70,000 points, I think, between first and second right there. And literally just under 70,000 points. Right. But awesome stuff from uh, Matt Bios and the rest of the crew. They're really deserving of that championship. And they might be able to get at least one world champion this year, especially on the men's side with Griffin being the number two seed. Right on. Well, we will take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And we will dig into the Visla CT Shaper rankings when we get back. All right, welcome back to the lineup. I'm Dave Prodan here with Mitch Salazar. It is now time for the Visla CT Shaper Rankings final update. Shaper Rankings! Quick refresher on how we have measured Shaper performance in our second season, the Visla CT Shaper Rankings. It is a combined men's and women's ranking, counting all surfers finishing in the quarterfinals or better. The Shapers receive the same rankings points that correlate to their respective surfer finishes. So the higher the surfers place, the more points that Shaper receives. We have tracked the Visla CT Shaper Rankings from Pipeline through Cloudbreak, and we now have a winner. So in addition to being honored as the 2024 CT Shaper of the Year at the WSL Awards, this year's Visla CT Shaper rankings will also be gifted an overnight stay and surf at Surf Ranch Lemoore, courtesy of the Kelly Slater Surf Ranch and the WSL. So Mitch, <laughs> big surprise. When the dust had settled on the Visla CT Shaper rankings post-corona at Fiji Pro presented by Bonsoy, the winner of the 2024 uh, series is San Clemente's Matt Biolis and Lost Surfboards defending CT Shaper of the Year, now going back to back. Mitch, we've been tracking Lost performances all year, and they absolutely decimated the field. 220,570 points in total, which, as you pointed out, is so close to being 70,000 points on the button ahead of Sharp Eye at number two. And they were pretty balanced across the men's and women's field. It wasn't just the men's team that was dominant or the women's team that was dominant. It was both. And the sheer quantity of team riders 
that performed for Lost Surfboards is nuts. On the women's side, you had Caroline Marks, Gabriella Bryan, Sawyer Lindblad, and then wild cards like Carissa Moore in Tahiti and Aaron Brooks in Fiji. And on the men's side, they had Ian Gentile, Griffin Colapinto, Crosby Colapinto, Joan Deru as a wild card in Portugal, Cole Hauschman, who won Bells, Cade Matson, and Iago Dora. So that's 12 different team riders collecting points for them throughout the season. And Lost Surfboards is very deserving of that 2024 Visla CT Shaper of the Year title. Mitch, you yourself have had a mayhem or two under your feet in the past. Just what is going on over there at the moment? I think they just have real hands-on attention to their athletes. And, um, you know, when it comes to Matt's relationship with the majority of his surfers, it's usually very, very open. I mean, Cade, Cole, all those guys usually are in touch. And they're locals to San Clemente where not only Matt lives, but also their number one star on the men's side, Griffin and Crosby live too. So having that kind of inner relationship with a lot of your surfers is a huge thing. It really allows for a lot of development within not only your own boards, but also the fins that a lot of these guys are riding too. As you know, Mayhem has a signature fin with Futures, which is amazing. I believe they also do one on the FCS uh, side too. But just overall, like his kind of communication and his relationship with a lot of the surfers over there, especially with Carissa on the women's side, I know she didn't really have you know, the keeper results this year, but she had them for many years before that. And now Caroline being the number one on the women's side, you have Gabby Bryan over there too. And of course, Aaron Brooks, who's more than likely going to qualify for the championship tour at the end of this year on the Challenger Series, is going to be huge for him. Sorry, Limblad also, shout out to her. She had a very successful rookie season. Rookie of the year, by the way, congratulations to both her and Crosby. Actually, Mayhem had both rookie of the years this year. So congratulations um, to Matt Iolos for that too. But, um, I think it just comes down to being able to be communicative and, and open with your athletes. And it seems like that's worked out, especially with Gian Bernini at the head of the marketing department and being the team manager. Mm. seems like they got the perfect working relationship right now, Dave. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up kind of the people behind the scenes at that program. Um, yeah, after Fiji Rap, uh, Matt had a very gracious post on, on his Instagram. I'm going to read parts of it. And he says... A huge thanks to our crew at Lost Surfboards, especially our team that drops everything to rally, building boards for the pros. Mike Kinna, Jeff Widener, Chris Kaysen, Tommy Liebling, Jacob Hernandez, Ryder Biolis, and of course the pit boss, Gian Bernini. We won the Visla CT Shaper rankings back to back. Most proud that our team was built through a farm system, each server having been with us since pre-world tour qualified on our boards. All of this team have been with us since teenagers, many like Griffin and Crosby, Sawyer and Aaron since preteens. This is what it's all about. No hired guns, no big name free agents coming over mid-career. Homegrown talent, working together to take on the world. Bravo, Sir Ranch, here we come. <laughs> you know, Mitch, the work that they've put into their team is evident. And it feels like in reading Matt's post that they actually have a guiding philosophy of homegrown talent, no hired guns, et cetera. What, have you, what do you make about that compared to maybe how other programs build their teams? Well, it kind of goes through tiers, right? You have the mm. people that have already been there. They're established. They're already set in terms of their competitive career. You have the up-and-coming QS surfers, Challenger Series surfers that will eventually get there. And then you have the people, as he said, preteens, people that he's been seeing since they were very young, including... Aaron Brooks and Sawyer Limblad. That's what it comes down to, maintaining that relationship for many years. Look at Caitlin Simmers with Chris Boris, you know, like mm. she's been loyal to him the whole time. Courtney Conlog had an amazing relationship and still does with Tim Stamps over there in Huntington Beach too. So kind of enduring the most difficult of processes when you're going through those growth spurts right there and knowing that you're going to be able to find your right boards at the right time. You know, it's really valuable stuff. And, um, you know, also shout out to Shao Kobayashi, too. He does all the accounts over there at, at Mayhem and makes sure that everybody not only gets paid, the boards are getting paid for, it too. And, um, you know, having those people in your corner as well, as Matt was saying, he he really thanked everybody. It was a collective we won, not I won. And I feel like that goes a long way, too. And um, he's getting pushed by everybody else worldwide, too. Mm -hmm. Look at how good JS has been the last year or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially with Kali Vast on on the brink of also qualifying for the championship tour, Sierra Kerr on the women's side. So he kind of feels that pressure as well. And having those homegrown talents come through those programs right there is probably motivating him even more. But um, I also will say another thing too. I, I know I 
kind of talked a little bit of crap uh, about lowers in the last segment. It's also the perfect trading ground for a lot of these surfers and boards. So you're able to get a world-class wave, a very consistent wave throughout the entirety of the year to break right there at home. You're training at the right spot, Dave. Mm. It's interesting you bring that up because that's something I've been thinking about just the last couple of years, but particularly just looking at the dominance at the end of the 2024 season. Like 20 years ago when I started, you know, everyone knew about lost surfboards, but, you know, their team riders were the Lopez brothers, Corey and Shea, you know, <laughs> Wardo. When surfers would come to lowers for the CT, you'd a lot of like the Irons brothers, Bruce and Andy would ride them, a, a few other surfers here and there. But the dominant global brands on tour, you know, were Channel Islands and DHD and, and JS with the rise of the Coolie Kids and, and, and Kelly Slater. So Lowers kind of was like almost a specialist wave where the world's best surfers would say, oh, yeah, like, you know, Matt's boards and Lost surfboards, they work well there. But like, I'm not going to bring them to the South Pacific or I'm not yeah. going to bring them to Snapper yeah. Rocks or I'm not going to bring them to Europe. And it feels like in a relatively short amount of time, like if you look at 10 or 15 years, that's been flipped on its head, where their team is having success all over the world on these boards. And, you know, I, I'd imagine that you've kind of had a little bit of an inside track on that, too, just seeing the evolution of models working, you know, away from blowers as well. No, for sure. And um it all comes down to time spent in the water. And uh, mm. Matt's, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying this as, as honestly as I can, not to throw shade. He's not the best of surfers. But you don't necessarily have to be the, the best surfer shaper mm. to have great boards. I mean, look at some amazing shapers that probably surf too much and they don't put enough time into the actual work and, and their craft. And I feel like him having a balance of that, especially with his kids being surfers and being involved in program too, there's even extra motivation right there too. But no, for sure. Um, I would say that even 10 years ago, they still probably weren't the same name that they were. But as soon as they signed Carissa and she was kind of like the staple of their crew for the entirety of time, I was like, okay, She's traveling the world. She's already been world champion, but there's still probably potential for a lot more. Guess what? Matt was probably able to get the scoop on a lot of the locations she was surfing at, especially with those kind of conditions alone, getting more time in the water. So it all comes down to evolution. Mm. And unless you're like truly right there on the spot, like Britt Merrick is at most of the events, you're not really getting hands-on information like you would from a lot of other people worldwide. Matt's not necessarily present at each and every event because he can't, but his surfers are, mm -hmm. his managers are. A lot of these people in the industry that work for him too are right there. So he's getting the inside scoop, and that's just always putting an add-on into a lot of the equipment, especially for the Driver 3.0. To me, it's the most high-performance board in the world, and you could probably put that in any single wave worldwide, and it'll work at every location. So shout-out to Matt Biolos, the entire uh, cast and crew over there, in uh, Mayhem and Lost Industries. Amazing stuff. And uh, congratulations on another back-to-back -back championship this year for Shaper of the Year. Definitely well earned. A couple other notes before we leave the, the Visla CT Shaper ranking segment. You know, of that kind of tier one of, you know, you've got half a dozen to maybe, you know, a dozen surfers on your team at the start of the year. you got a lot of opportunities to get results. You know, you look at the other, the other board programs, Fiji was a good event for Sharpie. We talked about Rio Waida yep. and yep. Tatiana Weston Webb making the finals, although both of them losing to lost team riders probably chaps their ass a little bit. You know, <laughs> Jack Robinson had a third and Joanne DeFay had a fifth. So great event for Sharpie. Um, you know, Pizel, you know, they only really have John and, and Tyler at this point. Tyler had a good event. John, he bowed out before the quarterfinals. A couple of semifinal finishes for DHD in Molly Picklam and Ethan Ewing. Both of them will be at the finals at Lower Trestles. And then Channel Islands, I felt like they finished the year strong. A couple of fifths, quarterfinal finishes from Ima Kalani DeVault and Baron Mamiya. You know, programs, they have life cycles and... and I think something that we saw in, in, in Matt's quote is something that's been true is they're developing this pipeline. They never want to run out of talent coming up. But other programs don't always have that luxury. Like they might have one or two stars. They might have a gap few years. Some of them are rebuilding. You know, out of those top five, you know, we'll put Lost off to the side, maybe two through five. Sharp Eye, Pizel, Channel Islands, DHD. What did you notice in Fiji and maybe just generally throughout the year um, in terms of how you predict, you know, who will kind of rise and fall in 2025? 
Well, just as we've texted about for, I think, the last week now, it's really funny that we have the Visual CT Shaper rankings and have, like, a champion at the end of the year. And then the two people that are number one in the rankings right now are so irrelevant when it comes to the people that won Shaper of the Year. It's it's hilarious to me. John Florence from Pizel leading the rankings on the men's side and the Caitlin Simmers from Chris Boris. The only surfer from Chris Boris that we have on the championship tour is number one in the world. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like... Both of those deserve a lot of exposure and being talked about. John Pizel has done an amazing job with his small team. And, you know, even having Sakura on, on his boards for a couple of events, too. I thought she looked real good on those boards, personally. Um, Tyler Wright had an excellent showing right here, which is, you know, real nice to see her get back to her competitive form. I will say, though, I think the most impressive part about this year was that we not only saw a balance on the Mayhem side, I feel like we saw a lot of balance with the people that are getting back to the point that they were at before. Jason Stevenson and JS Industries, mm-hmm. Ramsey Bukiam, as I said before, I know Cali Vost, not on the CT, but getting those performances outside of CT competition, I think is huge in terms of exposure too. Um, I'm a big, big fan of Darren Hanley. I think he makes amazing boards, but I feel like their team didn't necessarily perform the way they wanted to, including Molly Picklin, um, mm-hmm. because we hold her to such a high standard, especially after the first two events of the year. Like I was claiming that she was going to be world champion this year, not to say that that might not be the case in a few weeks, but um, I'm just not necessarily sold on it as of this moment. I feel like Jacob Wilcox was an integral part of their team too, and him falling off um, during the mid-year cut wasn't something beneficial to them. I thought Liam O'Brien had a couple of excellent results, mm. but kind of backed off in, in the back end of the year. Um, and I want to say, once again, congratulations to what Britt Merrick and Brent Power have done to Channel Islands. They've had a major resurgence. Mm. They're relevant once again, and um, in terms of popularity, they might be, outside of Mayhem, the most popular brand out there right now. Yeah, no, those are great notes. And, you know, shout out to TNC Surf. They did very well throughout the year. Yep. You know, they, f- they finished fifth, mostly on the consistent results of Brisa Hennessy with assists out of Hawaii from the likes of Kanoa Igarashi and Isabella Nichols. You mentioned Chris Borst. He took out the single team rider title, finishing seventh overall exclusively on the strength of current women's world number one, Katie Simmers. And I like the point you made about, you know, John John is, is world number one. You know, Pizel finished third in the world. Um, Caitlin Simmers is world number one. You know, Borst was in the mix at seventh. You know, different programs have different approaches. And, you know, I think that Pizel and Borst probably get as much as they need out of having sort of more focused teams. Yes. That Lost does, but Lost probably has a huge advantage in having a diverse team too. They have a huge catalog of board models too, right? So they're getting so much R and D out of that team. And the last thing I'll say too, you know, DHD and Sharpie, they did contend this season without the use of their big guns, right? In eight time world champion Stephanie Gilmore and reigning two time world champion Felipe Toledo, both taking the year off. Both are scheduled to return in twenty twenty five. I mean, things move so fast on tour in terms of talent development, talent progression, that it will be a wildly different world in 2025 for both Steph and Felipe. It'll be interesting to see how they impact the Vistla CT Shaper rankings next season. Yeah, and hopefully they do come back to it. I feel like the tour needs them, especially uh, on the men's side. I feel like Felipe would still push a lot of people, and he'd actually be one of the lower seeds next year, so him matching up against some of the high seeds would be really interesting heading into 2025, and uh, especially with Fiji being the final event of the year next year to crown the world champions. I like that call-out right there, especially Steph on the backhand. We haven't seen her do too well on a lot of lefts on tour. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that is it for the Visla CT Shaper Rankings final season update. We are going to come back after the Lexus WSL finals. We are going to play a game for 2025, but we'll we'll tease that out and do that in the uh, next couple of episodes here. We're going to take one more quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And when we come back, we will answer listener questions. All right, welcome back to the Lineup Podcast. I'm your part-time co-host, Mitchell Salazar, here with the CSO of the World Surf League, Dave Prodan. And remember, if we don't get to your question in today's episode, we'll do our best to respond in our DMs, as we always do. Dave, let's get into our first segment of the podcast, or actually really the last one, but it's our most important segment is what I was getting to. At Rory Evans 1, how does the rise of Aaron and Katie compared to Steph and Carissa when they were Groms? Good mm, question. That is a good question. Um, 
I mean, the world's totally different, right? The tours are completely different. Um, if you compare when Steph and Carissa were ascending versus when Katie and Aaron are ascending, um, the media marketing landscape's completely different. And I think the age gap's an important one if you're going to compare both pairs, right? Like, so Steph at the moment, she's 36, Chris is 31. That's a five-year age gap, which mm -hmm. when you're a teenager or in your early 20s, that's a huge gap. And I think, you know, Katie's 18, Aaron's 17. So I would consider them like generational peers where like Steph and Carissa really weren't. Um, you know, I, I think Steph, Carissa, and Aaron, they all won CT events as wild cards before they actually qualified for the tour. Katie didn't, but I don't think that's really impacted Katie's like performance so far on tour. Um, it's challenging. Like I think there's some overlap generationally with Steph and Carissa. There was a bit of a rivalry, but the rivalry with Carissa was probably more with Tyler Wright. I think they are yeah. of a similar yeah. age, and they were really going head to head. Like Steph had achieved so much by the time Carissa hit the field that she was kind of established. And I mean, the fact that she's continued to stay on tour and continue to perform at a high level just speaks to her longevity. And she is truly the GOAT, I think, both from a performance standpoint and from like an achievement standpoint. Carissa is amazing. I, I think that the impact that she's made on surfing was really more outside of the jersey, which is saying a lot because she achieved so much in a jersey. But Everything she did before she qualified for the tour was so preternatural and incredible. Her performances on tour were impressive, but you know her video parts, like in "Leave a Message," and just generally were were really inspiring. And so, you know, and Steph is an incredible free surfer too. So I think they they are similar, but I wouldn't compare them generationally. Where if Aaron qualifies for the CT next year, as it looks like she's going to, I think her and Katie will be a really interesting rivalry to watch. You know, they're, they're very different surfers just from like an observing standpoint. And they also seem like they have very different dispositions. You know, Katie seems a, a lot more kind of like casual and natural and maybe just a little more aloof, but like this incredible talent and can obviously turn it on competitively where Erin seems like she's an amazing talent in herself, but she seems really polished and focused competitively. So th that kind of feels like the point of difference between those two. I don't know, Mitch, what do you think about that question? No, I think it's an excellent point that you're making right there. I feel like social media has made things um, a lot more exposed for both Caitlin and Erin, um, especially Erin's side. I, I think mm -hmm. we've all known her for being the young girl that was at Waco when it first opened doing those massive airy verses. And up until this point, she hasn't disappointed in terms of her progression and her development, especially when it comes to competition. After only having surfed for eight years now, meeting Tati, that, that event in Honolulu Bay, and eventually getting to this point where she's at now, winning on the Challenger Series, winning her first CT event as a wild card too. I think the major difference is just exposure, you know, because um, mm -hmm. back then, like Steph and Carissa were in magazines, as you said, Carissa did have a couple of movie parts, Leave a Message, which was an all-female surf film, a real good one, by the way, by Nike 6.0 back in the day. But I remember Carissa, when I first started surfing, had a, a bonus section, I believe, in Young Guns 3. And she was kind of mm -hmm. like the big thing in Roxy back then. She was coming up through the rankings. She had already surfed multiple heats against the guys in NSSA competition and in a couple QSs. I actually think you're at one QS, weren't you, where Carissa dropped a, a perfect 10-point ride in San Miguel, maybe yeah. when she was like 13, 14. <laughs> yeah, like, there's a couple of those moments that didn't necessarily get enough exposure because we didn't have the social media presence, the kind of media attention that we do nowadays on not only surfing but sports in general. So um, I feel like with that, Katie, Aaron are both getting that. Sierra Kerr is another one, too, that I'm also yep. thinking of. And I also want to give props to everybody that's kind of made that kind of moment happen for them in their careers, including everybody that's really done not only well through social media, eventually gotten to a point where they've actually gotten into the QS, made it to the Challengers, and then the CT, too. I'm talking people like Mateus Hurdy, who at the moment is one of the Brazilian hopefuls to qualify for the championship tour. I also feel like we've seen Sierra Kerr for many years now, and she's fully mm. turning into the young promising surfer that we've seen so far. So that's yeah. the main difference to me. Um, I feel like when it comes to performances, though, they're pretty similar. Maybe just um, the progression factor a bit more on both Aaron and Katie's side.
For sure. I'd add one more name to that group, and, and I know you think highly of them too, but Bella Kenworthy, I think, oh, yeah. is, is sort of in the mix. I think they're all friends, you know, Katie and Aaron and um, – I'm losing my, my mind here. Um, Molly. Kit yeah. Molly, thank you. And, yeah. and, and Bella, like they skate, they surf. Bella's had an incredible year on the Challenger Series so far. You know, she won in Bolito. She finaled in um, the U.S. Open. And so, yeah, I, I just think, like we said earlier, like this en masse, like, like – ascension of this generation is going to be really interesting because it i think it's happening faster than it used to happen you know we used to say probably the generational shifts like finger in the wind on the men's side you know 20 years ago were about every five years you'd see like a new crop of whatever it was the Cooley kids or the the momentum generation or whatever you know you know dane and jordy's the the the, the kai neville group every five years they'd come in and and, and shift things around Back then, it used to be every 10 years, right? You, you, you'd see kind of a generational shift happen on the women's side. I think it's happening faster now because yeah. you have all this young talent on tour right now. And then this new crop coming up on the Challenger Series, they're not really going to be pushing the current crop out so much as like challenging one another. You're going to have a really <laughs> like potent top 17 over the next few years, I think. And maybe it is an argument to look at the actual field sizes because I think you're just getting such a high concentration of women's talent at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, um, you know, major respect to all the women that were amazing in the 80s, 90s, mid yep. to early 2000s too, but there was such a big generational gap right sure. there when Steph took over the championship. She's still the only person, and I feel like, I don't know if this record's going to be able to be broken, but the only rookie that's won a championship tour title in her first year, like yeah. pretty ridiculous stuff. And, um, you know, could it be possible if Aaron does it next year? But um, I don't see it happening. I feel like Steph is just kind of a one in a generation surfer. And then you fast forward into the next one. And now the next one that we're seeing coming up, I'd be, I'd be a little preoccupied if I were any of the female surfers on tour right now. Um, <laughs> Getting into our second question, Dave, at Ito underscore OFEC 11. An amazing season for the wild cards. Please, please relate to this and give them respect, which I feel like we have most of the season. <laughs> yeah, but, we, um, we'll, we definitely we'll give them even it. more respect right now. I can't personally relate to being a wild card and having success, <laughs> but no, I agree. I feel like every time someone does something, we, we celebrate it because it's interesting. I do think it's a good question, um, and it's a... Uh, Helpful because I actually do have a breakdown of the wildcard performance that I've drafted uh, for another project I'm working on. Ooh. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I would agree that it was a quote unquote amazing season for all wild cards. There are absolutely some bright spots, but you know, over the course of the nine CT events this season, there were 34 wild card attempts, both allotted and and as replacement surfers. And of those 34 attempts, only eight were successful in getting quarterfinal or better results. So that is, you know, 24% success rate, which is good, but I wouldn't like classify that as amazing. And of those successes, you had Francis Joan Deru with the quarterfinals in Portugal, Australians Morgan Sibilic and Ellie Harrison with quarterfinals at Bells, Australian George Pitar with the semifinal at Margaret River, uh, Kelly Slater as a wild card with the quarterfinals in Tahiti, uh, Zhao Xianka as a wild card with the quarterfinals in El Salvador. And then, of course, the big winners on the women's side. You had Tahitian Vahine Fierro in Tahiti and quote unquote Canadian Aaron Brooks in Fiji. Uh, it, it was, there were huge bright spots, but I think that's more a function of just talent firing all over the place. And I think there's an, a little bit of an imbalance. I think probably the standout to me on the men's side this year, and I know we talked about it a lot when it happened because we'd been watching him for a couple of years on the Challenger Series, but it's George Pitar. Um, he's a rip curl team rider. He's a tall guy. He's a big guy. He's really polished. He actually had a great heat against Ethan Ewing uh, at Winky yeah, Pop. That, Bells. Yeah, yeah. That, Bells and Winky Pop that... Some people say he won. He was very gracious in defeat. And then he went to West Australia and just put on a, a clinic. You know, he, he made the semifinals. Um, CI team rider, right? Like, so that's another kind of development um, asset for them. Um, but outside of that, it, it really wasn't that impressive on the men's side. The women, on the other hand, you know, having two wild cards win in Vahine Fierro and Aaron Brooks is is very, very impressive. But I don't know, Mitch, what do you think about that? Like wild cards this season compared to past years? 
Um, you know, I feel like with the two victories, especially on the women's side, that just goes to show you how much there's been development over there, how much support they've received too, especially from their respective federations and whatnot. As you mm. said, uh, Aaron Brooks representing Canada now, big moment for them. Um, we're going to see much more exposure from that region, France and French Polynesia with Vahine, big moment for them, especially somebody from right there winning at home is major. Um, we've seen Manoa, we've seen Kali Voss make it to the final, but they hadn't won. And mm. uh, for Vahine to always make it to finals day, semis are better at that event was a historic moment. Um, I feel like on the men's side, though, the biggest wild card to do well this year was no doubt George Pitar. Um, the mm. semifinal over there in Marks, but even the result that Bells, I know that it wasn't a finals day appearance, but he pushed everybody to their limits. And especially that one heat against Ethan at Winky Pop, close heat. I still think uh, Ethan might have taken it out right there at the end, though. But um, overall, Pitar's right now qualifying for the championship tour for 25. So with those wild card opportunities, he probably incentivized himself to do even better on the challengers, which truly seems like he did because he's not only top 10, he's on the verge of qualifying and being one of the higher seeds, which would always put him up against mid-tier surfers in 2025 on the championship tour. To me, he's a threat especially with the addition of Snapper Rocks on the calendar for 25 next year on the Champ Tip Tour. He made it to finals day over there at the CS level this year. I feel like the wild cards were good. They weren't necessarily excellent, but a few of them, including Aaron and George, are going to be threats to deal with once they make it to the CT in 25, Dave. Hmm. No, great point. It's a great point. All right, last question. And uh, <laughs> it's a, a pretty funny one. I know who they're referring to. Uh, we've seen this post throughout social media i think the last week or so at Corey james walker appreciate you Corey. will julian in reference to julian wilson get some ct wild cards next season i hope so <laughs> yeah i know i saw i was i was uh i'm like oh Ju julian wants to come back that's cool i think his post actually said he was wanted to take a crack at the challenger series yeah. um but yeah I, I guess to answer Corey's question i mean anything's on the table CT wildcard wise, I think it's going to be challenging for him just by function of there are not a lot of wildcards at the CT level, um, event wildcards. And there's just so much talent, right? And there's so much talent that's coming up. And, you know, Julian, we, we've, he's been on the podcast. He was actually really candid and, and, and insightful, you know, when he was kind of looking at his career in retrospect. And this was after he, he'd kind of finished full-time competing and, he is just one of those really interesting case studies where he was so hyped, right, by the surfing industrial complex. I'd maybe put him in like, he could be number one, frankly. Um, Super Bowl commercials, Nike sponsorships, like, you know, multiple like Indies Trader, four boat trips a year, video parts, magazine covers, the whole nine. Um, good looking kid, like really interesting looking surfer, you know, marketed to death, right? And the expectation management for him when he was on the CT was really unfair. He actually had an incredible career. He, he challenged for the world title multiple times. He won a number of CTs. He's a triple crown world champion. He won at Pipe. He won at Snapper. He won in all these places. And yet, I don't know how he feels about it, but it does feel like there's an element of the online surfing world who are still critical that he underachieved versus, you know, that, that image that was marketed about him. And so I wonder if some of that's driving him as well, oh, you know, a hundred percent. And, and I don't know, like I, I, he's someone who is free surfing, especially when he was coming up was mind blowing. His surfing on tour is one person's opinion felt a lot more conservative than his potential. Right. And we've talked about that in the past where, you know, over the last 20 years, you would have the championship tour, it would have the world's best surfers on it. They would not surf their very best in heats when I started. You know, you would see them surfing at 70, 80 percent pretty consistently, maybe a couple of spikes here and there. But they would save their best surfing for video parts or free surfs. Yeah. That's completely inverted today. That's been completely inverted for almost a decade where and you've heard this from photographers um, in the surfing world who would say the same thing. They're like, you know, surfers used to surf 70% in their heats and 100% in free surfs. Now it's the opposite to the point where it's like, it's not really worth shooting them free surfing because <laughs> they save it all for when the stakes matter in their yeah. heats. And for someone like Julian, I would love to see him come back and go full throttle. 
I think the last few years that he was on tour, I think there was some injury stuff. I think there was some motivational stuff. He just didn't seem like he was surfing even at 70%. Um, yeah. It felt really conservative. And if he is sort of... Um, you know, unburdened by what has come before him sort of thing. And he comes back and he's ready to let it fly. Like, I'd love to see an unleashed Julian Wilson at any level of the sport. But uh, I don't know, Mitch, what about you? What's your, what, what, how did you feel about Julian when he was coming up? Uh, you were a young surfer as well, of course. And how do you feel about him now? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is that Julian Wilson never lost a spot on the CT. Uh, he gave it up. Remember, uh, after the Olympics, he said he had fatigue. Yep. He wanted to stop competing for a while. Totally got it, especially with what you said. Like, the guy was the most marketable person in the surf industry. And um, I was a huge fan of Julian Wilson. I remember watching Young Guns 3 mm. and Excess in the background with Don't Change. Like, that was the epitome of, like, surf videos right there. And um, I'm always going to be a fan of his. But when it comes to competitive surfing, in terms of that generation of Australians, Owen Wright and Julian Wilson might have been the biggest pain in the ass when mm. it came to competing against them. Like, dude, those guys were just animals with priority. They used to be great at converting on scores on horrible waves, and they'd find a way to beat you. I mean, just ask Gabe. Like, I, I'd actually put Gabe and Julian as the bigger rivalry than Gabe and John. Because right, Julian right. was like always the guy that was pushing him to a point That's where right. like he couldn't withstand it. He beat him at pipe. He beat him in Tahiti a few years ago too. Literally in like six, seven minutes in that final over there. And um, I think that Julian Wilson has a lot more to prove. Can he do it though? I don't know. Especially with this generation that we're seeing right now. Like I feel like he'd be able to win heats, but will he be able to beat the top seeds out there? That's the biggest question that I have in my mind. So. I'd say he might be able to get the, the wild card in the snapper just because he's won there before. Mm. It's probably the place that he's closest to on the championship tour in terms of location. He wants a, a wild card for the Challenger Series, though. And I know Corey uh, asking the question right here is asking if he'll get wild cards for the CT. Maybe one. Could mm. it be two, depending on his performance and, and how the events stack up, uh, you know, one against each other. I feel like, yeah, on uh, the Challenger Series, you want to give it to him as a regional wild card. Why not? You know, go ahead and prove, qualify once again for the CT that you're capable of doing it first and that you're still relevant because he's obviously got the surfing. Is your physique and is your mentality there? That's to me the real question, Dave. And um, I think outside of Kolo Handino, yeah, he probably was the most marketed surfer on the planet for that being time. And um, I'd love to see him compete at least in one event, but um, I don't know if he's going to be able to succeed the way he thinks he is. He does. I mean, as someone who follows him on social, he does look like he's on the fitness train like he looks mm -hmm. like he's been running a ton and training a ton and then the clips you do see of him surfing like it looks like he could still do it i think we yeah. talked about it earlier in the the episode with regards to steph and felipe the level of surfing at the bleeding edge of high performance on the championship tour changes so much in one year so imagine multiple years of coming back on but Hey, I, I would love to see it. Everyone loves a good resurrection story. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens come 2025. Thanks to everyone that wrote in uh, questions at, at the lineup pod. If we didn't get to your question, we will try to get it in the DM. So keep keep communicating with us. We love a good conversation. And uh, yeah, Mitch, this was exciting. Good to have you back. We're going to do another episode after the upcoming Lexus WSL finals. Ooh. But uh, yeah, a couple of weeks. Everyone strap in. We'll see what happens. Yeah, hopefully you get waves and uh, the performances are mind-blowing too. John being the number one seed, I'm excited for him. He definitely deserves number three out there. Caitlin Simmers too at number one. Let's go. I feel like Italo is going to be a big threat though and watch out for Griffin too. But I said this before and I'll say it again. I think Caroline Marks is destined to become a two-time world champion at one point. Will she be able to do it this year? It's going to be exciting, Dave. Love it. All right, Mitch, I'll see you in a couple of weeks.